Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Laura Henriksen. I'm the Director of Learning and Community Engagement at the Poetry Project. It is such a pleasure to be here with you all and an honor to welcome tonight's poets, artists, thinkers, Anais Duplan and Golden. We'll hear first tonight from Golden, followed by Anais, but before I turn it over to them, I just have a few reminders and updates. Tonight's moderator, the wonderful Corey Hutchinson, is adding a link, in the a link to the chat now with some helpful Zoom tips and best practices. Please note that we are recording tonight's event. You're welcome to have your cameras on or off as you prefer, but please keep in mind that if you have your camera on, it's possible that your little tile will be included in the archived video. I also wanna note that it's possible to access a live transcript of tonight's event by clicking that little red live link in the top left corner and selecting view stream, which will open the transcript in another browser window. If you have any Zoom questions or run into any difficulties, please don't hesitate to reach out to anyone with staff after their name and we'll be glad to help. So too, and crucially, if you experience or notice any maliciousness in the chat, please reach out to anyone on staff so we can work to get that resolved right away. We're grateful to you for joining us in the ongoing effort to build and nurture safer spaces where we can listen and learn together. Corey is now adding to the chat a link to our statement of safer spaces. Whenever we gather, sharing our time, even if not our physical space, we remain committed to building with you all an environment that challenges and resists ongoing structures of hierarchy and harm. If this event were taking place in our usual venue, we would be gathered together now in St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, where we have hosted events for more than 50 years. St. Mark's Church was built over the site where Peter Stuyvesant constructed his family chapel in 1660. Stuyvesant enslaved 40 people and in his time as Director General of New Netherlands increased the population of enslaved Africans in the colony whose stolen lives and labor were used to construct the buildings and streets on this stolen land. St. Mark's Church is located on the unceded homeland of the Lenape people, Lenape Ho King. I am speaking to you tonight from what is called Sunset Park in Brooklyn, which is the unceded homeland of the Canarsi, a Muncie speaking band of Lenape people, a neighborhood whose waterfront was redlined in the 1930s, a waterfront that is now the site of municipal detention center, a federal prison where 1,600 people are currently experiencing incarceration. As we gather across various neighborhoods and states, it gives me occasion to remember that it's not just some of the land that was stolen or some of the land that needs to be returned, but all of it. It reminds me too that to return the land is not a matter of transferring capitalist ownership, but as many indigenous thinkers have taught us, a radical rethinking of ownership and belonging centering indigenous autonomy and active relationality and responsibility. To reiterate Gloria Anzaldúa's assertion, this land was Lenape Hoking always and is and will be again. Corey is putting a link to a map in the chat now, not to endorse it as complete, but to invite you to join us in learning continually about the land we occupy, its history and ties as a path towards deeper accountability. Thank you for reflecting on this with me. We will hear now from Golden, a poet whose work has compelled me to ask in new ways, what is the relationship between form and family? In Golden's work, I am repeatedly struck by a type of generative formal rigor or precision where innovation is alchemized as invocation, the poet cultivating new forms out of very old ones, sort of like how in how the intricate filigree of lichen overtakes stones with vibrant and uncontainable life. In their poem, When I Was Seven, I captured a honeybee in a Poland spring bottle to solve the mystery of economy. The reader is offered directions for a scientific experiment where the conclusion is not the acquisition of more facts, but a turn to unknowing and searching, a reminder that, quote, everyone is outside looking for their missing brothers, unquote. Or in another poem, First Day Job Introduction, Golden uses the vacant form of a questionnaire, transforming it from a tool for superficial identification, appeasing bosses, flattening workers, into what feels like a living portal, answering prompts like, 
languages I speak with autobiography. And my favorite book is with my twin brother's thread tags from Salvation Army. And still other forms vibrate in defiance of all summarization, spatial and sonic, fragmented and crystalline throughout the appearance of family relations, twin, uncle, mom, dad, finds Golden's work like a bright and complex constellation, both personal and global historic, a history of how to survive, a song to remember those who don't. Thank you so much for joining us to read Golden. It's my pleasure now to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um... Thank you so much for having me. I first want to just start off by introduction and say my name is Golden, my pronouns are they, them, and I am currently based in um, Boston, Massachusetts, which is on Wampanoag, um, um, is on the Wampanoag tribe land. And I try to always um, name that and say that, and I appreciate the Poetry Project for being a space that always um, starts that, because I feel like we can't go into the deeper conversations about um, where I come from or where I'm from without recognizing that America is all stolen land. So I really appreciate that for that being the introduction. So we're gonna be going on this journey together. Um, I'll be um, pretty much, um, how this will pretty much go just to kind of set the scene is I'll be um, reading or performing alongside um, images from my book. And I'm just gonna get started and I'll pretty much uh, time myself and I hope you all enjoy. Departure Ceremony 2021. Yes, we met fuck and you. No dawn can change how we remember American in this America. The caged tongues, severed top sovereignties, the American assassinations. America, I doubt was ever worth this many grandchildren, this many wars, this many words, this many Americans. Heaven is how I make peace with a atrocity with America some days. I pray because my God knows the ceremony of vengeance better than America. Knows that Americans cower the same when stars shine back the bodies ravage on tyranny's topsoil. How dare men think America and say united nation reborn when America's soiled roots didn't speak English. When sidewalks are hearses and houses. When police hunt black Americans standing still we will never know how American we are until we will never know how American we are until history asks what was freedom for America and we have no choice but to point to Americans and forefathers who only wanted white children out of chains. Americans made America the bomb forever bursting in my window. Flags, a beautiful weapon, me against America. X, Y, X, 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 Y. Everyone wants a chunk of flower flesh on my front lawn. Seasoned I walk and niggas here rioting. I just want to party when I switch. I am a man, same suede black as their do rags. People ask me, boy, and I answer with fist. My friends cry, kill Mo, prying the dirt from children's buckled teeth again. I'm used to metaphor and shame. It never lingers. Some sisters call me kin because I am trash and I know it. We dissect Adam's rib because holding my girl with my dick in my palm means safety, means School children get silent, means church girls playing on pavements with my joy. Uncles at my family gathering will tell you I'm a product of my own hood. I offend those who don't know biology like I do. Cookout mouth and grateful bartering. God gave us language for devil, but did not bother translating the sin. My black ass needed 
a beating glutton for blood that saves relentlessly. I got to be gun whole, sweet to sit at our table, unbothered. Everyone wants me to kill my demons because my healing is so, so important. I soldier here for God and still think about sobbing on Sunday, study the shunning. Hand me a goblet of my own testicles and ask me if my mom made me this soft. Ask me why I haven't learned to stand outside too long in my own skin. And I will tell you about flowers still souring on my front driveway when it rains. Looking like mirrors, I still don't know their name. XX. Everyone wants a chunk of flag flesh on their front lawn. Sacrificial, I walk and sissies here rotting. I just want to pass when I switch. I am a bruise, same suede black as their acrylics. People ask me, girl, and I answer with fatigue. My ancestors cry, kill me, prying the dirt from corpses, buckled teeth estranged. I'm used to mania and shame and never leaves. Some sisters call me misogynistic because I am transgender and I know it. We dissect Adam's apples because holding my titties with my dick in my Bible means anarchy, means school children get sliced, means church girls painting on pavements with my jugular. Uncles at my funeral gathering will tell you I am a conductor of my own death. I offend those who don't know God like I do. Cook out mouth and graceless bartering. God gave us language for angel, but did not bother translating the pronouns. My black ass needed a father glutton for blood that loves relentlessly. I got to be glory, whole sweet to sit at our table breathing. Everyone wants me to kill myself because my healing is so, so ugly. I squatter here for God and still think about suicide on Sunday. Study the celebration. Hand me a goblet of my own piss and ask me if my mom made me this pussy. Ask me why I haven't learned to sit outside too long in my own shit. And I will tell you about sisters still souring on my front sewer when it rains, looking like mulch. I still don't know their sound. All right, we're gonna take a deep breath in. And we're gonna take another deep breath out. We're gonna take another deep breath in. And we're gonna take a deep breath out. Y'all, there were never any neighbor boys gnawing at our summer sweat sickles. No gym winks, no crust chafing, no coming age where we'd match the dogwoods. We hung up like girls pearled in pain of windows, dreaming about lungs fat as pokemoke, poor drunk livers cannon towards the sun. Drown in black velvet clouds. The weather girls in fall is how we sing to the black mascot. The murder men in uniforms in South Pole. The slick boys. If we could die for Dick or Devin or Daquan or Devante, we'd can cut our mouths to be tulips or terriers leashed by our hunger and touch. Master Maws will look down on us legendary Urban legend, like a God-fearing black man, like a black mother letting the outside roam her house, like a cousin's new nutbuck Timberlands kissing the mud's face and still coming out blood fresh. Virginia is a special country, a seasonless neverland where the tire tar is a faggot. The skidded skunk sinking in the snow is a faggot. The boy who meals in the art room alone during recess is a faggot. The herky at the talent show is a faggot. The brine blood making out with our fists. The girl's coogee track pants. The boy's gum pink razor. The juice of joy is a faggot. My niggas twirling in prisms is not how we found our way out. Leasing our bodies to cinema. Back home in the basements, in the cathedrals, in the kitchen, at the spades table, at the food line, at the barbershop. We don't use that word. Queer, we say 
Ain't Miles Ben's wrist or didn't Rachel come home without her prom date still talking that girl up about a sleepover stirs the sweet tea. My South, the South is a country full of black speech symbols, a symphony of silences sons sprint from, daughters sing to. I'm not saying there's no one like us. What I'm saying is we didn't know where to shout, to twerk, to leave our bodies limbs. Sometimes you have to run away to love your country back, to know how to look your family in the face with skunk in mouth, razor on belt, tar as mascara and defiled dreams. We wife nations, sovereignty sisters, moon mothers, faggot forgotten. we knew new, new nations. if I was being honest after Frank Ocean. If I was being honest, nigga, I want to know how to escape the ship and the shore side, the morning saccharine and American sacrifice, the nigga loyalty and ordained lobotomies. Adulthood is full of old shit scuttle, happy adolescents who forgot their niggas can't float in this dimension. My nigga, only after Sunday. My nigga, only after my mouth be a pulpit for people's daydreams of me. For my family's revival in the cemetery of me. And still, these niggas be salve slipping down my East Coast. And still, my mother mutates misconception with misunderstanding. She fears the nigga she son is stillborn. Y'all country and niggas want me in homes healing, but some niggas want me believing them a niggas that parts the pitted rivers in us without therapy. We are all countryless niggas and still, I think if I've died the beat in simple syrup, niggas will understand me. Every silly second of depression sarcophagus, every second heartbeat not surrounded by sibling nigga shit, by neurodivergent niggas shit. I'll be blunt at the end probably because of repetition. Because a nigga don't want to be immortal. Just want to make it to the joint at the end of the day to niggas who take my body in their whole mouth and ask, ain't this God? Niggerly sanctification. I feel closest to dominion when I'm not talking about my mother in every poem. About becoming the woman niggas flee states to understand. I don't take the train away to pray for us anymore, but I'm still trying to prove my niggas wrong about my pronouns and I get it. Progress and reprogram. Reprogramming what niggas command, but I really want to be a God nigga sometimes so I can unmake people's memory of me. The nigga truth is I can't, can't, can't stand to sit by them salting my river wounds, but I don't say that because truth hurts niggas in my family. Truth is I had a backpack once behind the shed and my parents' permission. Behind the niggas I would have left and truth is I would have left if I had a heaven to go to. A nigga bana. I I still face niggas who don't know I can feel the earth's axis tilting every time I cross the Mason Dixon because we don't choose our niggas or who our demons are but I want to choose how my angels remember my nigga how my aunt how their ancestors found the sea because I remember every commandment I've broken every night twin and I walk to the seven off Bethel off Parkway out the woods to spend our last nigga nights nickeling our subway fare so we can belong in new cities we learn to say nigga I've learned to say nigga I don't like repeating myself instead of I'm hurting by my shoreline nigga cuz I can find my mother tongue buried in me sometimes I've known Hampton so like I, since I could spell nigga and it's still fear, feeling Ferrari foreign now like the Polaroids niggas used to window at the public library Northampton might not still know me as its nigga because we can both tilt our head back to the past and still look at ourselves the same. But blood niggas, my family, don't lift off on feelings alone. Memories get coined tokenized, niggered, and still I believe in the future. There are other nigga Bibles being written in this dimension because I'm going to have a nigga's kids one day. Kids who love their uncles, who call me mom, who call us niggas, who look down on me one day and say, golden, I found the sea, my nigga.
Pandemonium 2020. And maybe at the gates, I need no one by me. And maybe everyone is no one mothering my palms into wings. Maybe I don't need wings to remember myself loved. Or maybe I need angel ancestors or anchor ankles to remember I lift when I hear my brother's accent in my mouth. Maybe every love has left a licorice lesion shaped like a door, or every lover has left a lost lesson shaped like a mirror. Maybe gates are the door, and the door is a captain, and the captain is a weapon, and the weapon is God, and maybe not, and maybe yes. Maybe weapons are loyal, meaning blood bound, meaning subjective servant, meaning tyrant teetering, maybe words betray the blood and what the brain thinks and knows and maybe cells are the brain engine, the heart breath. Betrayal may be the anatomy of death or synonym for set free. Maybe mother friends, them sisters, day one niggas know how men have been, so they name their children after poisons, marigold, glory, cathedrals. Maybe that's why we call our friends bitches, shooters, hitters, anything after what fraught families have hidden under their tongues, under their mattresses. And maybe we were never women, but the father. Maybe mother is to be a flock of fathers who knew they were the one before beginning, before boys genesis. And maybe being a man means remembering for a lifetime that you've been mothered, maybe, maybe. And maybe something better than now. Maybe we've been better than now, but maybe we are wings. Maybe we've always been a captain, blood bound doors shaped like gates. And maybe we are loyal weapons mirroring no one. The greatest love of all after Whitney Houston or Serena Williams. I remember it like we all won Wimbledon that weekend, the beginning of the Williams sisters dish dance. 2003 is my favorite waltz to wonder about. The silver hoop medallions meddling the air, the orange trim, the plies after a picture passing shot, the prime puma pouncing the diamond hearts, you black with your sister black and awing white. I was 12 and could still crown a fade when I recalled knowing what a phenom was. Back when I didn't know if I would walk back home in the hue of dusk, my dad and I didn't speak or sing in the same room about much outside of Saturdays, but he helped me turn a vice that volleyed my devils to dirt. I believe I've flown sometimes trying to serve like I could beat anyone in white too, be as strong as a girl who believed in herself so much that she could never lose until it happened. See, in Virginia, we waded our baggage from miles to the hard courts in spring to condition for what weather and city windows might take from us on any day. Sometimes we go to Briarfield after walking to the YMCA, past the railroad tracks, past the McDonald's that stayed open even if they wasn't shooting down shell or during a bomb threat at school. Before our worst times, we'd gather as a frequent family to match on Sundays where the cracked courts by the Slade Memorial Middle School crooked the ball on the baseline. And Twin and I never sulked or stopped screeching as we imitated raising the chalk. We ran more than we did win. We aired and still extended because serving mid-flight feels like belonging to somewhere better. I'll never forget how I sliced, flew that serve like you, I hoped, and aced the boy at the club, the one I couldn't afford to dream about after the winter of junior year. The first match I won, I chariot sang because my brothers and dad were sideline che child cheering during points. On second serves, when I thought, can I win? I realized it's the survival that brought us to our knees, to think. You were the one who proved we could continue 
Serena in my tattered tee. Behind the trailers were a white Spanish teacher from Michigan taunted children who had no hair and simple dreams. On the same courts where Twin and I doubled and buried our bicker bickering in the presence of students who spit fags out their beaks. I've been on mountains too, wondering why people who know my name hold my body in their mouth without permission. I've had to stop learning, questioning whether my gender belonged and to and belonged by example. Some days I just want to wear my orange dress to the tennis courts and come back home unbothered because I know I can be invincible by myself and lose the sport of perfection too. I've watched you float against fear, no less free. I don't know how to tell you not to cry when people not from Compton who've never stood at the baseline of ash, doubt, and wonder, will she always be her name? When women who blend into Wimbledon and the men who shy away from saying black pretend 23's mundane for any human. But last summer, when an impossible fever was taking my people away and I didn't know if I would still have friends in this brave blue world, I remembered champion meant give it to the sky in victory or defeat. Even if you got to a town stump, then dumped your shoulders off, return or don't, I'll always think of you in this country when I fight for freedom with my Nikes laced to the calf. It's hood funny how I picture the gold wing gather, the American abolition, the blades in the Wilson bags turning to God's wing every Saturday now. Serena Jamika Williams, Mrs. Silver and Gold, there's a sky legacy about you, Black, still sistering Black, indivisibly Black, flying in the face of Queens, Black, belonging to greatness, Black, and God. For a twin. Bitch, you aren't improper to love. You are impossible to gun without the world watching me turn to genocide. I'd be a criminal for life sentences, say less if they want me to prove it. This nation knows not what it birthed. Beasts have human etymologies. Even evil sounds treasonous to our tread. They've only seen vibrations of hell. Only seen beasts, only seen Victims as ghosts, twins be omniscient like light. My hands travel area codes, speak to tongues. We be God cause we worship intravenously. Once I dreamt you tuned and decided enough trying to breathe kneeling to convince humans to human, mothers to mother, oh womb warrior. Oh, we're sisters separated. Even our family don't want us talking about childhood loss, about our country lessons. Even our brother don't want us at war without him. Fear faces every photo of us. At Granny's house, we say we ratchet so, we, so people can hold the weight of our weapons preamble. Oh, say, can you see the warning, the wishing for this end to be psychology? Would a therapist apologize? What if healing could horizon home? I give giving up. I give speeches to the sky. There'll be no here left after your heaven. What's to say this world would be? And I will always be your mother. For Stephanie Michelle Waters Golden. Head up, shoulders strong, like Paul Bearer at your brother's funeral, strong, like, like you forgot to die today, strong, like. Like grandmother's skeleton key strong, like, like you my hip and my neck strong. Don't forget that you my boy when everyone else is watching. 
You can't scrub the sun out of my child. You already lived 20 years without a halo. You must absorb all the boy you can until they turn you into a prayer. How are you going to try and kill my child? You remember that suicide is never the answer, right? I brought you in this world. And I wish a bitch would try and kill what is mine, even if it is you. Don't forget my fist is stronger than any bullet. That peroxide cannot clean a body like a prayer. My hands have never stopped repenting for you. Didn't I say keep your head up, boy? If your mind is stuck on the cotton clouds, how are you going to hear the bell ringing your name? I still talk to God about you. Still hold your baby picture on my chest at night. Don't stop holding my picture close. Even if both hands are shackled behind the back, I gave you. I understand. You think you a grown woman now, but I didn't raise you to talk back to your elders like that. You still mine. You still my child, boy. Don't put your head down unless God got you. Do you got him, girl? Here's my shoulder, child. I love you. And there is no condition in this world that can stop your mama. All right, we're gonna take a deep breath in. We're gonna take another deep one. We have two more palms left. Thank y'all for going on this journey with me. Hell, I know my superpower. I stare back at the solo sun and think I could take you down right to the cool core if my mother asked it of me, or if I thought my father would write it in his will or on a simple day. See, I'm less scared of spiders than of what it could be like if some people fly out the window of this world's womb web and I never got the chance to reach for them to tell them, save your last look for a better tragedy. Fighting scar sweet and scarlet, measured like a middle finger, might not be a love song in your neighborhood, but I'm a country bitch. The light catches dusk often in the summertime, even when the heat is noon high and the clouds peck pales and parade like elephants. I can sense it when I daydream, the adrenaline at oblivion, the raining obstacles of horizons and homes and here. Humanity, Some, sometimes I, excuse me, sometimes I win for miles, for weeks, for generations, asking to accept the end for others because I believe in better worlds. I begged ancestors, maybe I don't need wings to save a country, but that's not my superpower. I'm someone's child still staring at the star sun, wishing it never be my earth. I'm human after all. And this will be my last poem, thank you so much. This is Hometown Glory After Adele. I'm fake. Cause I've been companions with the same good, same dark gum niggas, ravens, dope girls since pariah and the ADHD prognosis and somehow think I'm going to escape my hometown anniversary. I'm running away when I know the answer to why I wish more days began quilted in quotidian quiet with soliloquies from my mother about how she misses Christmas dinners at daddy's house, back when we wore family out by darting the dozens. When can we make laughter our dominion again? Must we always decide between a country and, a chi and our childhood? I deserve to be a daughter, and my grandmother deserves more days where she remembers a German chocolate cake recipe better than any Pokemon praise dancer could. My God, my home is North and South, Southern and city skull, bone and breast milk from the most marvelous magicians this world and ever called mother, who is Pocomoke boy.
Who is any man who's not held my granny by the back and told her, we are blessed, you chose us. Yes, my family were pretty, but not a picture. We petty shredded our teeth against each other's necks. We rode through sundown kingdoms and tore down school systems. Hell, there's an alternate universe where we killed to set one another free. Golden, cause it belonged to my birth, to my pop-up's morning prayer, to my father and I's soul silence, diaspora doves, do we ever make it back from our origin stories? To the earth where our uncles rest, a porch holler away, Unionville, my always North Star, my better black nebula. I don't know geography or gender any better than I did in the 90s, find me here. X757, Y443, singing Jill Scott, living my life like we know my name. Thank you so much. Oh my God, Colton. Thank you. That was astonishing. Thank you so much. Um, wow. We'll hear now from Anais Duplan. Duplan's black space on the poetics of an Afro future untangles learning from achieving and instead offers me a way to read, which is another way of saying to be that is non-teleological. I mean, I learn a lot about art and music and freedom, but not in a way that centers the accumulation of knowledge as a thing you earn or own through a set of ever narrowing definitions, but instead is something in which you participate, to which you relate, becoming that is a process, becoming that is also unbecoming. This is transmitted to me as the reader in part because the modes through which the book operates from interviews with other artists to poems written in response to the visual art are disavowals of the stability of singular narrators and solitary voices. It is also transmitted in the book's final essay, a sort of accident insofar as it only came to be written after the original concluding interview fell through. Quote, change of plans, change of plans, who I am is a change of plans, Anais writes, and this changes me when I read it. In some ways I can explain and in some ways I can't. Changing here, as with learning, is not a step on a path towards a conclusion. It is instead a play of invisibility in public, shared inscrutability, finding and being found while evading, experiencing pleasure without the imperative to be pleased. Anais writes, quote, I don't believe freedom requires you to go somewhere. To get free is to realize you're free. I become highly disoriented. It's not that what was up becomes down, it's like the whole idea of up and down suddenly doesn't make sense, end quote. It's my pleasure to welcome to the virtual podium now, Anais Duplon. Thank you for that. Um, I, uh, Golden, <laughs> um, in some ways I wish that I could just not read now <laughs> because I sort of want to live with um, that experience for a while and I have so much um, love and admiration for the way that you embody your poetics um, and and bring it to life and for your bravery and heart and all these things blah 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 um, but yeah just very very grateful to be um sharing this virtual space with you tonight um so i will be sharing um a bit from uh black space uh, my book that came out a few months ago and um on screen you're seeing a three channel video that i was working on for the last few years that i was also making black space um i was a visual artist briefly before I was a poet and kind of have had a return to the visual arts um, by way of poetry. Um, and so what you're seeing on screen is a um, 
video poem called um, The Lovers or the Audience Who Watch, um, which is a line of poetry that I stole from Juliana Huxtable, um, who I reference in this book. Um, but I'm thinking a lot about um, attention um, as a kind of of love so the lovers are the audience who watch um and and thinking about like what do i spend time looking at um and how do i capture that on screen and how do i kind of um re-perform or recapitulate that kind of love a lot of that kind of love is what brought black space to life i spent a lot of time looking at people's artworks or looking at people's faces as I was interviewing them um, and thinking about how much I, I loved them or their work. Um, so I think I will read um, a section from the book that is poems. It's, it's mostly essays, but there is a small section of poems that I wrote um, in response to the works of Black video artists. Um, and my hope for the lovers or the audience who watch as a video is that even though there's so much, there's text happening, which in this three channel version, it's sort of hard to read. I, I think I hope for it to more absorb. Um, so rather than kind of trying to pull out meaning that, that, that you're making sense of things with your body and the way that your body makes sense of things. And so I hope sort of the same for as I'm reading um, poems and then afterwards that essay that Laura just mentioned that it's, it's more interesting to me if, um, if you just let your body absorb what's there and um, maybe go back into a sort of soft focus. Um, yeah, so um, I will just read and you can let my voice wash over you. <laughs> okay. Black screen. There are two major distributors of video art in the United States. I visited both in March 2018 in search of works by black video artists. Video art, an outcast in the family of the visual arts, isn't much talked about. Even less talked about are the contributions of artists of color to the field. In Chicago and New York, the homes of Video Data Bank and Electronic Arts Intermix, respectively, I spent hours glued to screens watching work that stretched back to the early 70s and extended into present day. So this is the intro that I wrote to the section of poems. Black artists have used video art to make social critique for a long time. I was blown away by the commonalities in works by artists creating in vastly different places and eras. As a medium, video art often repurposes purposes, materials, and themes from broadcast media like television and radio, which for a long time were the primary forms of news communication in this country. Now perhaps eclipsed by internet-based forms like social media and YouTube, traditional broadcast media still provide a fairly reliable way to gauge what the most relevant issues of the day are. These poems, each a response to a work by a video artist of color, represent my wish to provide another platform for this hard-to-find work, and to play with what video, a time-based medium, shares with poetry, image, syntax, rhythm, and sound. Both poetry and video art also investigate what it means to be a citizen at any particular time, and show that the social problems that were relevant decades ago, far from being resolved, ring true even to contemporary ears. Um, so a lot of the poems I wrote were in response to the works of um, Kevin Jerome Everson, who writes a lot about black people in rural Ohio and Virginia. Kevin Jerome Everson, Company Line, 2009, 30 Minutes. Black man behind the wheel of car pours wiper fluid on his windshield. Still from inside the car by opening the door and reaching his hand out. A black man who says he makes 30K a year after 16 years drives a truck. Columbus, Mississippi, 1981, moved here, stayed for five years, went back to Mississippi. His name is Swope. 
describes snow season, leaf season, cutting grass, working asphalt in summertime, city of man's field, many black people behind the wheels of cars, two men state exactly July 4th, 1975, when they arrived, when they started working their cement in relative darkness. He says he went to school in Asheville. Inside the car as a woman on the radio sings a song where he worked before a garbage truck, ski slopes, bunch of places everywhere, brick layer, Artesia, Westinghouse, Nashville, Tire, Scrap Yard. He has a daughter who just got back from a rock who reminds me of stepping in already placed footprints. Kevin Jerome Everson, Cinnamon, 2006, one hour, ten minutes, moves a woman in a field, her back to man, working the car, who calls out to Aaron, moves slowly, what flavor you want, the alcohol. At a drag race, there are drag cars and normal cars, there are flowers, blueness of car and man's shirt the garage window and also in the grass and trees air dynamics cooler air means cars run quicker aaron in blue taking off another man how he used to do his racing on the street from 1978 to 82 you don't have to have the best car luck of the draw it's god's will hands feet inside the car about to race once she starts sound fade she's exiting gives a piece to john outside a story about after his delay box broke after larry beat him respected him john is trying to fix the car as aaron watches she says won't make it john says no says it was stupid at first but ultimately thrilling 23 minutes 10 seconds the car picks up and drives it isn't dead the rurality of the surround ashley with cornrows says i love you no talking in drag when she was seven her dad got her a car feels lucky she has 20 trophies in her room she's sitting on the bed black and white and silent getting settled inside john and his influence is john ashley's father Aaron in a parked car zoning out. Aaron works at a bank and John is a mechanic and at work Aaron has her dreads pulled into a bun whereas on the track in a lot in some kind of forest clearing her hair is down. The saturation is different. People in bleachers. A young boy prepares to race a family unloads groceries from car into house with american flag that's what drag racing is its consistency the same shot four to five young white boys by the fence as aaron is about to begin we are inside a car looking out the windshield and the closest that we get Ephraim Asili points on a space age, 2007, 32 minutes, 42 seconds. We should go to the moon, astronauts in outer interspersed images of colorful garb, black and white in time, interspersed sense of the evolution of their costumes have remained the same. You are welcome to be citizens of the omniverse 
and music has the good and ugly in it. This would seem to distinguish pop from jazz or African American classical recalls some other horizon, the imagination, the traditional ignorance itself isn't strange at all. Ephraim Asili, Forged Ways, 2010, 15 minutes, 52 seconds. The sound from some other kind of space or craft and foot set in a downtown U.S. Shots into windows where flowers and mannequins with shots of impoverished walking downtown moves between that and a Caribbean nation, ducks, pigeons. I'm almost certain the flag is in the clip you took as we see from the vehicle, the roadway and house and building alongside it and the castle bring me to think of colonialism and the environments in which ways of life are forged. The sound of moving through it, the sound of photos taken, finally arrives home where his white girlfriend takes photos. The two of them lounge. She puts up cutouts, religious sits, worship in the other nation, and constant roadways and cars. Behind a chant in another language, the other location is this Ethiopia, and you, you were right about Harlem. So I think I'm going to read, um, spend the rest of my time reading from this last essay, which as Laura saying was not supposed to be here. There was something else that was here and that something else um, was uh, removed at the very last moment. And so I had to write this chapter um, and ultimately I'm glad that I had to. So the last chapter is called Black Space. When I had finished writing an early version of black space, a friend asked me if I had come closer to freedom. I said no, but I understood better what I needed to do to get there. I had said this much earlier on in my gender transition. Over the course of this book, I've gone from living as a woman to living as a man. I've had to learn new social norms. As a trans man, I ask myself when to be silent and when to educate. Once on a subway platform, a guy nearby to me said, Hey man, did you see that? A voluptuous woman had just walked by. Should I tell this guy how much it sucks to be ogled as a woman? I'd been initiated into a club I wasn't sure I wanted to be part of. I now had the privilege to be silent, complicit. The freedom afforded to me by transition is not that I went from one identity to another, but that I went from a singular identity to the slow, meticulous destruction of identity and endlessly morphing, changing, unreliable process. Identity is capricious. The first half year of transition, when I was painfully attached to my fledgling self-concept, I thought obsessively about my identity, how well and effectively it could be crushed. Around the same time my relationship with my family crumbled to the ground, I saw myself navigate conflict in ways that announced to me I would never be the same person again. Not only would I never be who I was before, but I would never occupy an identity in quite the same way. I had survived my own annihilation. 
I was not the idea I had put my credence into. I was somewhere else. To move toward freedom is subtractive. Less do I resonate with a piecemeal version of my self-concept made up of what I like, what I don't like, my political ideas, and the historical memory of my people, all monsters on the other side of a window. They look real. I can see them. They are frightening. They appear to be close. They can never touch me. The antidote to chronic loneliness isn't to seek people, it's to dig into what it means to be alone. My thoughts about the world around me are projections, each and every one. My thoughts about myself are projections onto what is ultimate reality, which has no words attached to it. Realization in itself produces a great aloneness in me. Judgment of the world around me is a way of forcing a relation where I feel the threat of the disappearance of my identity. The mind senses how tenuous identity is. If I don't keep working at it, it starts to fall apart. I don't control which pieces fall off either. I don't even know when they fall. I may just see myself differently. Why is the mind afraid to disappear, but when it disappears, there's no sign of it? Why is there fear around a process that produces serenity? I ask questions without waiting for an answer. Eventually, the questions themselves don't arise. For the past couple years, many memories from childhood and adolescence have returned. They are painful, other times benign, like the memory of a street I used to walk down or a bowling alley, an old apartment, a person I once talked to. The person I am today arises out of moments I can remember and moments I can. It's unclear if recovering memories makes me act differently or if I'm recovering them at instances of transformation. When I become able to accommodate the new information. The mind is a web. I see visual resonances, hear sonic resonances, feel how I felt before, and at the same time, feel about how I've felt. I don't need to know. As a result of many years of bullying by my peers and abuse from my family, I got it in my head that the best way to avoid future abuse was to know all I could know about the present situation, myself, others, but most importantly, about the world in general. I studied sociology and anthropology in college, plagued by the sense of not grasping social interaction. Mind you, it doesn't make you any less socially awkward to read Irving Goffman. I resemble today from the outside the mostly well-adjusted people I loathed as a misanthropic teenager. The reasons for writing a book, a desire to disseminate information, the desire to speak, a call to lyric, a cinematic urge, human minds are conditioned along many of the same wave patterns. What's inside me is much like what's inside you, what you want, where you're going. These are the qualities of a hive mind. In writing, Individual qualities become less important, even how the individual embodies the collective, a kind of individuality isn't important. I'm prone to overvalue the extent to which I am a unique person despite any, and there's copious evidence to the contrary. Who I am feels every day a little less important. Thoughts come faster than is possible to track. 
Typically, arguments unfold in linear or at least parallel pathways. I'm thinking about something you said last night, and it's made my work much better, but it'll be some time before I say this to you. I thank you in this indirect manner. I thank you with my eyes and my manner. There's never a dull moment. There isn't a topic in here. I don't know how to get out of here. I don't know who else to be. The race to freedom starts in immense, persistent pain, the pain of loss, the dog of grief which follows at my feet. What makes grief grief is the way it eludes articulation. It's like being toppled over by something that doesn't exist. What should I do? Pain arises, pain is being, pain dissipates, depression is a war with myself, pain is separation. Peace with paradox is what creates freedom, it's reflection upon the dualities that makes them dualities without reflection. They are a multi-branched plan. Have you ever thought about why you are here and where you are? Have you thought about the impulse to go forward? The impulse to go forward exists beyond any given action or any actor of the action. It's impossible to outrun myself. Wherever I go forward, I find myself. Why read to an audience? Why share work one has written? What is the point of artistic production that happens at least in part in public? Who is art's public? How does this differ depending on who creates and what is made? Does art need a public? In the last 24 hours, I became fascinated with the idea of invisibility. I've spent much time focused on the idea of a public for my work, whether I've admitted this to myself or not. Yesterday, I thought, what if invisibility is just as compelling? I thought about this as I walked home. When I passed people on the street, I thought about our similarity. When I see people in love, I feel invisible. It reminds me of when I felt love in the past. I was much like the people I see. Human emotions, though potentially vibrant, are much the same from person to person. We are much more similar than different to each other. I've held contempt for others. I've clung to my own righteousness. I felt others were lesser than. This was how I coped with trauma. I became a victim. Everyone else I conflated with my abusers. They were zombies bound for destruction. The world became a sort of static place where the interplay between myself, the abused, and my world, my abuser, repeated again inevitably. Hypervisibility is a sort of continued victimhood, a learned helplessness, a play I can play in forever. Just as I clung to my victimhood, superiority, hypervisibility, I clung to the idea that I could one day overcome these and become normal. Victimhood is the known. I've existed in victimhood for a long time, which has led to addictions or even an addictive state of being. Non-victimhood is the unknown. To propel myself forward into the unknown is to cast off a terrible, delightful cape of special status and to merge with experience, to merge with pain, the dissipation of pain, to be unidentified with either, to become the wholeness that I've sought. To my surprise, my attachment to victimhood is my biggest hurdle. For as long as I can remember, I've wanted to become whole, 
wholeness is what I am. I see I've been whole rage. To propel myself forward into the unknown is to lose recourse to my addictions. There just isn't enough time to build up the structure of identity before it's time to be. I don't have to think to be. I don't need any more information. I don't have to change. I'm going to stop there for tonight. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Anais. I've, I love this poem so much and that essay I've read so many times. It's really, I, it's so important to me and getting to hear you read from it was just um, such a gift. Thank you. Um, and now I'm really pleased because we have a little bit of time for just like maybe one or two questions from the audience if people want to put questions for On and Golden in the chat. I invite you to. I also, of course, invite On and Golden to ask each other questions. Um, I know that I have a bunch of questions, uh, but maybe I'll invite you, On and Golden, first if you have questions you'd like to, you'd like to bring up. No, I just want to start by saying that essay. That Stop. essay was everything. Stop it. I feel like I just needed to say that for the Stop whole, it right now. The whole <laughs> I literally have my paper. Like, I'm not even kidding, y'all. I was over here taking notes like I was in class. <laughs> Um, I'm definitely going to be going back to that essay. And you better about stop it. it. <laughs> um, I just it's like blowing. It was just, <laughs> I just, I just had to, I just had to break that ice and, and <laughs> celebration for that essay. When you said, I said no one, but I said no, but I know more what to do to get there. When you're talking about freedom, I was like. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. So and also you said this part where it was like to move to freedom is subtractive like the way you mm. talk about freedom i feel like only comes from black transness and i feel like yes so, yeah yeah it's so amazing and it's how i picture freedom too yeah and i think that there was just so many similarities that i felt in like it was such a pleasure to do this reading with you because it was so great to see like um, these touch points that we have never met. Mm -hmm. we met. I feel the same way. It was so yeah. great. Just, um, tell me about the images. Tell me about like, how do you, uh, short of, I want to be like, what's your process? But I'm not going to ask you that. Just like, how do you, um, 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 tell me about like the order of things like the, the photos, because I know you have a photographic practice and obviously you have this amazing writing practice, and but like the way that you perform as well. So uh, what's the order? Yeah, I actually just got this question today. So great question. Um, I always say that I don't believe in time. Like I don't believe in time the same and I feel like it, it's rooted in being, um, I have ADHD. So um, it's a, talking about more and I, Wow, wow, yeah. I don't believe in time. And I believe that um I believe that my poems, my photos are always being made at the same time. And sometimes they enter the world um in the moment they need to be in they need to enter the world. And I feel like my poems and my photographs are kind of me letting people into how I how I see the world because I feel like I think in poems, right? I yeah. think in poems and I think in image, images. And um, I think that like combining these archival images that are like literally from my, like, my life and then these kind of made up conceptual images that are also from my life, right? Mm -hmm. um, but kind of um, have a different um, intention behind it, being a world yeah. that I create, right? Um, yeah. I think that it all comes out in the same same moment. So for me, like um in a like a tangible sense though, like I think that like like the Serena Williams poem, which is yeah. is probably my newest poem, it's one that I feel the most tender about because I put <laughs> it like a couple weeks ago. Um and like that photo was out like taken like last year. Like that mm -hmm. photo was out in the world like in August or sometime. And um 
but the poem wasn't written until two weeks ago. Mm. But I feel like that Serena Williams poem has been written, I've been writing for 10 years since I've been, since I started playing tennis. I feel like I've always wanted, like I know my heart of heart was like, I could not have a book come out ever. Like I can't like write a manuscript without having Serena Williams because of how much she meant to me. Mm. Wow. So yeah. Let's play tennis. Um, I'm hella down. I love this. Okay. Tennis. Um, yes, I would love that. This reading is just me and Golden becoming friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm always like, I'll come to readings and I'm like, we're gonna be friends. We're gonna be friends. We're friends. Yeah, we're gonna yeah. have a kiki. Yeah. Um, when all this pandemonium is over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, I will. I would love that. Um, and I'm so excited that we got this space to um, connect because I feel like. Um, I don't know. I feel like the stars won't have aligned if, if, if it happens. So I'm really grateful. Thank you, Laura. Thank you both so much. I just feel really lucky that I got to be here for it. And I mean, I I think this is like a really beautiful place to say good night yeah. to each other. I really, sure. everyone's so much for being here. Um, I hope to see you all at the Poetry Project again soon. Um, I'm excited to see this friendship blossom. <laughs> we'll keep you posted. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for being here.